thank Frankie for his speech, and I now look to Adam Shuri, Secretary's Committee, Balliol College, to open the case for the opposition. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Madam President, for the opportunity to address this chamber this evening. I'm delighted to be opening the case for the opposition in this momentous debate. I'd also like to thank the Honourable Member of Trinity College for his opening remarks in this debate. What confuses me, however, and I'm sure it also confuses many of you, is what precisely the Honourable Member, indeed the whole proposition bench, is arguing for. <laughs> their, their entire case seems to rest precariously on what we take to mean by public life. Perhaps the proposition will convince you with, with ease that governments should not be run or influenced by religious figures, or that education should not include any religious element. Maybe even they will convince you that state broadcasters should not be allowed to show religious programmes. As much as they may try to make you forget it, it is, of course, their burden to convince you of the entirety of their motion that religion deserves no place whatsoever in public life. Note, then, a general opposition to religious control or to particular instances even of religion is insufficient. This is not a debate about religious extremism, but you must be convinced that religion deserves absolutely no place in public life to walk through the eye lobby later this evening. Should the six billion theists of this world be forced to only discuss their religion in private, concealed spaces? Should an athlete perhaps be forbidden from saying a prayer before a televised race? Maybe a cross on a necklace or a hijab must now be ruled illegal. My honourable friend seems to have failed to provide a convincing definition of what religion in public life really is. But if we're to take this absolute perspective, the subjection under which we would place a large swathe of the population seems entirely unreasonable. I hope to convince you all to join me in voting no this evening, but before I do that, it falls to me to introduce the speakers for the proposition. You've just heard from the Honourable Member Frankie Wright of Trinity College, a fellow member of the Secretary's Committee and a good friend, <laughs> whatever his questionable choice of college. Whilst his early education at Catholic school perhaps failed to make an impact, I suspect he might be inclined to cross the floor and join us if, as well as Mass on a Sunday morning, we were to consider Port and Policy a religious occasion on a Sunday night. <laughs> and in much less serious chamber before this, the Honourable Member successfully had me expelled on accusation of electoral malpractice. With less than a day until nominations close, I hope our run for standing committee goes a little more smoothly, Frankie. <laughs> that said, I wish him and his presidential candidate the best of luck. And I hope they can come up with an interesting slate name. I certainly couldn't think of one. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking after him in support of tonight's motion will be Professor Peter Atkins of our own Lincoln College. Professor Atkins is a distinguished supporter of Humanists UK and was the first senior member of the University Secular Society. Whilst on a television panel with Richard Dawkins, he was recorded growling at Mr Swinburne, the member to my left, may you rot in hell, which seems somewhat confusing for a man who doesn't believe in God. <laughs> we can perhaps forgive these minor errors, of course, for a man who dropped out of school aged 15. Next up on property. <laughs> Next up in the proposition is Miss Alvy Smith, an academic at University College Dublin and a key activist in the bid to repeal the constitutional ban on abortion in Ireland. She was named as one of the Times 100 most influential people as a result of her efforts on this. I'm sure, of course, she feels right at home in the Oxford Union, having run a campaign called Together. <laughs> Let's hope she's not impeached any time soon. Closing the debate for the proposition is Mike Newdow, an experienced ER physician, 
having attended the UCLA School of Medicine. Mr Newdow challenged the legality of the Pledge of Allegiance in the Supreme Court, losing twice. He also attempted unsuccessfully to have the words, in God we trust, removed from American currency. He also lost a lawsuit against Franklin Graham after he invoked God at President, Bush, President Bush's inauguration. And he attempted to do the same at President Obama's inauguration. I'm sure he'll feel very comfortable tonight on the proposition bench, once again being on the losing side. <laughs> Madam President, these are your speakers, and they are most welcome. Whilst then we could consider religion in public life in the, the stringent way that I set out earlier, I will be reasonable to the members opposite, to my friends. I see religion in public life as something a little like this. People should be able to debate religious questions as we are debating them tonight in this chamber. They should be able to discuss their religion openly. I would expect religion and religious questions to form some part of political discourse. And the state should be able to reserve, observe religious holidays and celebrations. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the position that I'm going to try to defend to you this evening. There are three key arguments I'm going to highlight to you in an attempt to convince you to join me in voting down this motion. Firstly, freedom of religious expression is an inalienable right. And any attempt to encroach upon it by a state would be the first step on a road to totalitarianism. Secondly, that the moral framework of the vast majority of religious teachings is generally a force for good and leads to a better society. And thirdly, ladies and gentlemen, I will attempt to convince you of the benefits to the community, to our community, of religious celebrations and holidays such as Christmas. The proposition is going to tell you of the evils of religion. Indeed, my honourable friend, Frankie, already has. They will tell you of the more odious parts of faith and make you fear an imperium in imperio, a fifth column, acting in service of a god and a church over their civic duty to the state. It is, however, the proposition who would make this dystopia a reality. In a chamber described by Harold Macmillan as the last bastion of free speech, it seems somewhat ironic that so far I've heard from a man, a man who described himself as a classical liberal, tell us that we simply banish the views of 60% of the population from public life and that those views will simply disappear. Whatever the many problems presented by religions of all kinds and colours, it will not help to simply remove them from society. All we will do is reduce our ability to tackle the radical elements with them through proper public debate such as this. Religious views have been persecuted for centuries, from King Edward's expulsion of the Jews in 1290 to the Irish penal laws. Attempts have been made by various political leaders to remove religious views from public life, and they have failed. They have failed every single time. I don't know what gave the proposition the hubris to believe that it is possible to remove all religion from public life, but I am certain it will become their nemesis tonight. You've also heard from my honourable friend on the proposition bench about how religion forces a moral framework on society. He's explained at some length the evil of this. Now, I have two issues with this perspective. First, the religion indeed actually does force a moral framework on society. For the most, vast majority of those in this country at least, their religious views are a choice. How strongly they follow those religious views are a choice. And secondly, I contend his position that this is even particularly wrong. We all follow a moral compass, or so I hope. Whether that compass is instilled by our parents, our education, our internal sense of virtue, or even our religious views, seems really to prove of little actual 
difference. Just as Sunday school may instill in children the belief that loving thy neighbor and attending church regularly is the path to a successful and happy life, Monsieur Love Island may instill a similar belief that being dumb and pretty is the path to success. And union politics instills a belief that you must be self-interested and fake. But I don't see the proposition calling for Love Island or union politics to be removed from public life. Considering many religious teachings generally aim toward what I at least would consider morally virtuous outcomes, or more morally virtuous than certain parts of this institution anyway, I'm inclined to believe that religion is, if not better than other moral frameworks, hardly a moral framework that merits being banned from public life. The last point I have to make this evening, ladies and gentlemen, is I hope a cheerful one for you all. Whilst the proposition so far has painted a, a bleak image of religion serving as the opium of the people, I urge you to consider what you most closely associate with religion. For me, the first thing I think of is Christmas. With the excuse of a religious holiday, family I have not seen for months gather together in celebration. I think of winter evenings, drinking mulled wine and catching up with friends. I think of carol singing, I think of secret Santa. The whole idea of family and friends coming together to celebrate is surely central to the religious teachings around these holidays. I ask those opposite, what is so bad about this? What is so bad about families, friends, communities coming together to celebrate Christmas, Hanukkah, or Eid, that it must be banished from public life? Are we really to imagine a world where the government cannot declare Christmas a bank holiday for fear of bringing religion into the public domain? Perhaps the Queen shall have to scrap her Christmas address, watched by an adoring nation of those of all faiths and none. If your fear of religion is that intense, that you have a Scrooge-like disdain for what seems to be such an intrinsically good occasion, I have only one thing to say to you, Frankie. Bar humbug. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I shall not keep you too much longer. You'll be pleased to hear. However, before you vote this evening, I urge you to reflect on this motion. Religion often deserves a bad rep. Acts of extremism inspired by radical preachers, the horrifying actions of religious cults, or the wars waged across the ages in the name of one God or other. But tonight, it is the proposition who are the real zealots. I reiterate the point I made at the start of my speech. The proposition's burden tonight is not to prove that religion is occasionally bad, or that it indeed often leads to disagreeable outcomes, but that it is so negative, so beyond the pale, that it should have no place whatsoever in public life. If, on the other hand, you share my beliefs, a belief in freedom of speech and expression, a belief in religion offering a moral compass to its many followers, and a belief in the good that religious celebrations bring to a community, then I urge you to join me and vote down this motion tonight. Thank you.